Hello and welcome to another episode of Lowdown. Today I'm absolutely delighted to be joined by John Muller, author of the Space, Space, Space newsletter, to discuss all things football analytics and this season's tactical trends. Welcome to the show, John. Happy to be here. Thank you for having me. No problem at all whatsoever, John. And I suppose we begin every podcast by asking the interviewee, John, where and how did they cultivate a passion for football growing up? And I suppose for yourself growing up in Texas, I'm all the more intrigued and curious. Yeah, I, I guess that the answer for that question is probably going to be pretty different from your American guests than your uh, European ones. So the way that it works in the United States is everybody plays soccer until they're like 12 years old. And then everybody forgets that soccer exists for the rest of their lives. Uh, so that was the path that I went down growing up in Texas. I played soccer from four to 12. Uh, then I played, you know, other more American sports. And then uh, in my 20s, I lived in Latin America for a while in uh, Brazil and Mexico. And so suddenly soccer was the only sport that anybody wanted to play or watch or talk about. So I started getting into it again. And, and I discovered that I, I had a real passion for the game. Uh, I was really intrigued by it because it was, for me, so much harder to understand than every other sport that I had played and, and been a fan of. Uh, and so I, I became a fan of the game, like really got deeply into it, watching Pep Guardiola's Barcelona, you know, who played the game in a very different way than almost any other side ever has. Um, and, and I really loved the way that they kind of brought order out of a chaotic sport and made it kind of make sense to me in a way that it didn't when I watched other teams play. Um, and so, yeah, for, for the last decade or so, I've, I've been getting uh, kind of obsessively into soccer, uh, watching it, trying to understand it through data analytics, through tactical analysis, uh, any, anything that helped me feel like I got a little traction on the game, uh, a, a deeper understanding of what was going on has, has always appealed to me. Fantastic. And I'm just curious to follow up on that point um, that you were living in South America, John. Did you find that, listen, I don't know how good your Spanish or your Portuguese is, but did you find perhaps soccer was a way of communicating with the local people? I would say that it was a way of bonding with the local people more than communicating. Um, you know, it's, yeah, I, I speak some Spanish, I speak some Portuguese. Most people our age all over the world speak English. So communication wasn't a problem, but, you know, having having a common interest was is always nice uh, when you're in a place where you don't know a lot of people. And, uh, you know, God bless him. Some of my friends tried to watch baseball and, and understand what was going on, and that just wasn't working. So uh, soccer was was our way of, you know, having something in common. And, of course, in a previous life, we were just discussing off camera, John, that you were, in fact, a lawyer for your training in law school. Um, making that transition to football, you know, there's no career path, obviously, that's certain. But football certainly is an uncertain pathway. How did you justify that? And I suppose, when did you first realize that you had something to offer the broader game? So before I was a lawyer, I was a journalist. Uh, I've, I've been a writer and an editor for, for years uh, before I went into law. And uh, then I, I, I went into law kind of about five-ish years ago, went to law school, joined a law firm, uh, realized that wasn't a career that I wanted to pursue. Uh, but while I was going through all that, I was getting more deeply into uh, soccer analytics um, through a site called American Soccer Analysis, which does MLS-focused data analytics stuff. Uh, and so I started writing about soccer more. I started uh, a website dedicated to the MLS team that I followed. Uh, but you know, I, I also love European soccer and I was, you know, watching this and talking about it with various friends, but I didn't have a place to write about it. And so I started this newsletter that allowed me to pursue all of the things that I'm interested in, you know, the data analytics, the tactics, uh, just following what's going on in the Champions League and the, in the largest leagues. I, I always want to know, like, what makes good teams good, right? I want to know, uh, basically, how Pep Guardiola's Barcelona was so magical to me back when I was first getting into the game and how, you know, different teams that are very good now or that have been very good in the, in the last decade are different from one another, right? Like 
Pep City is is a very different team than Pep's Barcelona or than Pep's Bayern. Uh, you know, Thomas Tuchel's Chelsea is is a very different team, uh, but is also very good. Like I'm I'm looking forward to the Champions League final this year. Long story short, I started a newsletter, uh, wrote about the things that I was interested in, found an audience, and made it a career. Simple. <laughs> Easy as that. Easy as that. But um, I certainly think the work, I mean, Elliot McKinley and a few others were doing at American Soccer Analysis was certainly before its time. And the detail those guys used to go into and still do. But even if we we're to focus, perhaps, John, on just analyzing a game of football itself, I mean, where are your eyes focused? For example, I know, listen, if I'm coaching a team, I know I'm looking at multiple reference points during a game. However, if I have my Chelsea jersey on looking at the screen, you're looking from a broadcasting angle, and in reality, you're just looking at the ball. You don't want to be preoccupied looking with off the pit, off the ball movements, so on and so forth. But what are you, as an analyst, looking at? I, I think the contextual distinction there is nice um, because the way that the game is mediated to you matters, right? Watching it in the stadium is different from watching it on TV. Watching it from different points in the stadium is different, you know, whether you're high up or low down or at one end or in the middle. Um, and, and really the reason that you're watching a game affects what you watch and what you care about, right? I, I think that I would get extremely burned out on soccer if I tried to be deeply analytical about every game that I watched all the time. Sometimes I'm watching just to enjoy it because, you know, I love the game and I relax a little bit, you know, I, I yell, I get drunk, it's, it's fun. And sometimes I'm watching, you know, in my video editor, rewinding every play like 10 times to understand exactly what happened and why I'm cutting up things. I'm, you know, combining uh, different sequences to compare them. So yeah, there, there are different ways. Uh, but I would say that kind of like the, the average way, right? And somewhere in the middle of that, the way that I usually like to watch a game is, uh, you know, first, first I want to know what are the lineups? Why are the lineups, right? Who's playing where and, and why? Is it just rotation? Uh, uh, or, or was there a tactical decision in, in how people lined up? I want to see, you know, in those first five minutes after kickoff, when the tactical instructions are still fresh in players' minds, where are they going and, and what's the intended shape, right? How does that shape change by phase? Uh, I, I try personally not to watch the ball uh, most of the time when I watch a game, unless I'm, you know, really just doing it for fun. I'm trying to pay more attention to what's happening off the ball, because I think that that is, uh, that's the way to get a better picture of what the team is trying to do. Uh, when, it, when I'm trying to pay more attention to the team in possession, I'll usually look one line ahead of the ball. Um, when I'm trying to pay more attention to the team that's out of possession, I'll usually pay more attention to, you know, kind of the guys who, again, are, are one line removed from the ball. Because if you go uh, farther than that, you know, it's kind of a, a rest position for those players. And if you go closer to the ball than that, everybody's reacting to what's happening on the ball. But if you look in the middle, I think that's where you see kind of tactical thought going on and players are executing pressing triggers, right? They're executing uh, off-ball movements to make the next pass available. They're thinking about what their team is trying to do. And so that's why I like to focus on that middle area. That's neatly explained, John, to be honest, because um, I think one thing in football, it's not, you know, of course, it's an 11-a-side game. It's not like basketball where you have ca causality to a point or where you can actually measure causality. In football, there's little cause and effect. But as you said, if you're looking and distilling perhaps one line forward or back from the ball, maybe that is the next kind of spearhead or the next forefront of football analytics we could look at. Um, I think what you said at the start, how football is mediated and presented to you is actually really interesting because one of the questions I wanted to ask you concerns tracking data and event data. We've seen in the past year, there's been a big push to make both more contextual. Um, I just wanted to know your thoughts on this, John, and basically football, we see how not prehistoric it is when compared to other sports in terms of this, but we've been waiting a while, haven't we? Yeah, yeah, I think, I think that we are on the cusp of 
a major new era in data analysis in soccer. Uh, I mean, in a way, we're already in a new era because it took the first decade of, of Opta stats, Opta event data being widely available, and then StatsBomb and Scout and others now provide event data. But it took a while after we had event data for people to figure out like all the things that we could really do with it besides just count possession percentages or whatever, right? It's not very interesting. Uh, and so, like you said, I think that there's been a movement towards providing more context uh, for data in soccer. And as there's been a growing demand for context, we've started to realize that event data is woefully inadequate to give us that context because it only tells us what happens on the ball. And like I said, I'm only watching what happens on the ball when I'm drunk and having a good time. When I wanna understand the game, I need to know more than what's happening on the ball. And I think the data analysts uh, would agree with that sentiment that if they really want uh, a deeper understanding of what's happening in their data, they need to know how players are moving and positioned off the ball. So that's what tracking data does, right? Using cameras or sometimes using uh, algorithms trained on broadcast television, they can capture the movement of players uh, off the ball. And there's there's kind of a middle ground that I've written about uh, that StatsBomb recently announced the contextual event data, which essentially takes a freeze frame every time there's a pass or a tackle and tells you just kind of static anonymous positions of everybody who's on the TV screen at that moment, which isn't quite as much context as you would like, right? It doesn't, especially not having uh, movement vectors, not knowing how fast and in which direction those players are traveling, those freeze frames can be kind of limited in what they can tell you. But it's a lot more than we know in event data, right? And crucially, it's easier to work with, right? I'm, I'm not personally very good at coding. Uh, and so I can't do anything with full tracking data. If you gave it to me, I would just be terrified. Uh, but I could maybe hypothetically do something with contextual event data. That's a more manageable data set. It doesn't take like huge resources to store and to pull. Uh, and because we're still pretty early in the data analytics revolution in soccer, most clubs don't have analysts who are proficient at working with tracking data. Uh, I mean, it's, it's honestly kind of shocking how few clubs have people who are really good at that stuff. And so, yeah, I think that we need this, this middle ground, this contextual event data um, so that people can start to think about what it looks like to bring context to bear on the data that we've been working with for the last decade. Of course, I think you're just bringing more and more kind of football-based language into the arena as well with that, John. Um, one of the case in points, um, there was that uh, famous interaction with Pep Guardiola in his inaugural season at Man City when he was asked, what is tackles? We don't coach tackles. But if you look at some of the latest research in the field done and this pass prevention model, that, you know, in an effort to understand things, we as humans, we want language to kind of label it. And I think if you have something like that pass prevention model, it's absolutely the possibilities attached to it over the coming years could be absolutely fascinating. Um, one case in point, I'm sure you're aware, it was only a few years ago when we only had as far as XG expected goals as a metric to go to. And we've seen the effect that has had over the past few years in terms of the sure amount of decrease we've seen in the amount of long shots in games, not just in England or Europe, but all over the world. Um, I mean, where else have you seen the biggest strides made? Let's see, there were, there were like three things that I wanted to talk about in that question. Um, first of all, I guess, let's, let's talk about the pass prevention first, just because that's like a cool new thing, right? This is, uh, you were alluding to uh, a newsletter that I recently wrote about a presentation that a friend of mine named Aditya Kothari, uh, who's... Uh, an independent analyst working out of India gave at the Opta Pro Forum presentation in March. And the Opta Pro Forum is an annual event where data analysts present kind of some of the newest and most exciting work going on in the field each year. Uh, and so Aditya gave this presentation that was essentially quantifying uh, the value of the space that defenders were denying to attackers. 
So famously, event data is bad at measuring defense. You know, if you know how many tackles and interceptions a player does during a game, that won't tell you very much about how good they are at defending. Uh, Virgil van Dyke, for instance, rarely records any defensive stats, and yet everyone understands that when he's healthy, he's one of the best center backs in the world. So you need to know, you know, how, how are defenders denying valuable space to the attack to get a better sense of what it is that defenders do when they're defending. Uh, but the reason, part of the reason that Aditya's model was really interesting to me was that it was a continuation of kind of the, the newest and sexiest line of research that's going on in, in data. And this starts with uh, kind of two seminal papers uh, that have been done uh, in tracking data research. I, I told you that there are not very many clubs that are good at this. Uh, the two clubs that we know are very good at working with tracking data because they've published work on it uh, are FC Barcelona and Liverpool. And Liverpool has uh, a guy named William Spearman who used to be a, a particle physicist. And he approached soccer like particle physics as just you know kind of a bunch of players in the ball bouncing around and he thought, well, okay, one useful thing that I can do with this data is try to figure out who controls which spaces, right? Who's closest to the ball if the ball goes over here? Who's going to get there first, right? So it was a new kind of way of thinking about what he called pitch control. Um, so yeah, con control of space was the idea there, right? And then this other line of research done by uh, FC Barcelona's analyst, Javier Fernandez, uh, worked on expected possession value, which is asking, uh, given this situation on the field, which team is likely to score and which team is likely to concede? And if you do some action, if you pass the ball over here, how does that change those probabilities of scoring and conceding, right? So we've got kind of who's controlling what parts of the pitch, and then we've also got how valuable are uh, those spaces in those situations. And that work had mostly focused on attacking stuff at first, right? But because event data is actually like somewhat useful at measuring attacking stuff, the really interesting thing was how can we use these new tools that you know measure space, the, the thing that defenses care about, and how can we use those to uh, to quantify defense in a in a more useful way? So that was the Dithius thing, and I've talked for so long about that now that I forgot the other two parts of the question that I wanted to respond to. Um, the first part I mentioned was about Guardiola, of course, we don't coach tackles. Uh, you mentioned, yeah, of course, Aditya's pass prevention model. The other part was, yes, XG. So, of course, XG being the maiden metric we've gone to, and we've seen the correlation being that we've seen a notable decrease in the amount of long shots to correspond with the proliferation of XG. And my follow-up question to that then, John, was, I suppose, where else have we seen strides such as XG? Coming that's right, that's right. That. Yeah, that was a great question. Um, yeah, so, so at the same time that we've got all this kind of like space age stuff going on among the top data analysts, we've also got kind of the public catching on to what data analysts were doing five, six, seven years ago. Uh, you know, XG uh, really... Honestly, XG, like the idea of XG has been around in academic research since the 90s, uh, but it was, it was the early 2010s when it really kind of caught on with the data analysis community. And uh, so first we saw kind of more publishing on this and a lot of like conversation uh, on blogs and papers, on Twitter, whatever, among data types. Then we saw clubs kind of catch on that uh, actually, you know, it's it's probably a better idea to make that last one or two passes to try to get into a much higher value shooting situation uh, than to shoot from a, a very low percentage shooting situation. Although I've also written about some analysis that argues the opposite, but that's that's a whole other thing. Point is, clubs decided like, okay, it's it's better to go for these high XG shots, right? And so we've seen shot distance fall in league after league, year after year for the last five, six years or so. Um, and so that's been, you know, if, if you ask for like, what does analytics look like on the field? What is it actually changing in the way that we play the game? That's kind of the closest that soccer has to 
say the NBA's death of the mid-range jumper, right? It's all threes and layups now in basketball. Uh, in soccer, it's all close shots and not shots from 30 yards out because the percentages just don't make sense most of the time. Um, but what what else have we seen change in the game? I think that's actually a really hard question. We, uh, you know, we we always talk about XG. That's like the one stat that everybody knows. Like, okay, that's that's analytics. XG is analytics. Well, there, there's a lot more going on, but all the other things that are going on haven't produced a very kind of clear lesson. Like, shoot closer to goal, right? That's a that's an actionable thing that teams get. Um, but I think that most other analytics is focused more on trying to understand all the different things that make players good, that make them valuable, because the most useful thing that analytics can do for a club right now is not to redesign its whole game model, right? That's a, it's a very big question that frankly, we're just not good enough at analytics to do for the most part, unless maybe you're Liverpool. Um, but for, for most clubs, they're just trying to figure out, okay, how can I find better players in the transfer market out of these thousands of players around the world who are available? Uh, I can't send scouts to watch thousands of players. How can I use data to pick out the like handful of players who are good at what they do, who match my game model, who match my budget? And so I think that that's really where data analytics has done most of its work so far. And in terms of the newsletter you do, John, with Space, 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 as I've said to many of my colleagues, tremendous, and I'd recommend anyone out there to subscribe. But that's exactly what you do, John. You take cold, <laughs> cold-hearted cold data analysis and you present it in a fun, engaging, insightful, but yet concise manner. Um, I mean, some of my favorite articles in the past few months have been, as I mentioned to you before, an email, both the elbow backs and the Myers-Briggs personality test and midfielders. I'd just like you to explain what is the concept of an elbow back and why have we seen it being so proliferated and used widely over the top five European leagues this season? Yeah, so I think the easiest way to explain an elbow back is that it's somewhere between a center back and a full back. Um, and what makes elbow backs really useful uh, is that they play both roles at different points in the game usually different phases in the game. Um, so we've seen kind of, you know, as, as, as you watch the bird's eye tactical development of soccer, like different formations come in and out of, of kind of vogue, right? I think that among elite teams, the best of the best, uh, there was a move from kind of a 4-4-2 in the 90s to uh, some combination of 4-2-3-1 and 4-3-3 after uh, Guardiola's Barcelona and was so dominant in 4-3-3. That was kind of the thing that was in for a while. And then uh, Bayern was really good in a 4-2-3-1. So we kind of moved in that direction. And I think that for the last five years, I, I would say that 4-2-3-1 is kind of the default formation in soccer. 4-3-3 was still favored among some elite teams. But in the last year or two, We've seen a lot more elite teams at least show some some curiosity about three back formations, um, and very few of them want to commit to it full time. Uh, Tuchel Chelsea is probably the closest to an elite team that is more or less standard three at the back. Barcelona has been pretty standard three at the back lately, um, but a lot more of them are interested in dynamic formations that can be four at the back in some situations and three at the back at some situations. And when you do that, you need a player who can be a center back sometimes and who can be a full back at other times. And so in, in the newsletter that you're talking about, uh, I kind of broke it down into like sort of five different advantages that, that I've seen elbow backs kind of provide for these top like Champions League knockout level clubs. And, uh, a lot of them were focused in the buildup. Shape changes in the buildup have become uh, a very, uh, I, a, a, a trendy thing, right? Like when we talk about positional play, juego de posición, like whatever, it's, 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 um, it's all about very structured buildups, right? Players know that when the ball moves here, I need to be in this kind of part of the field in response. Uh, if my teammate moves here, I need to go fill in that role in the formation to keep our structure. 
Uh, and so when we're talking about building up in these kind of varied structures, uh, it's, it's advantageous to have three VAC systems sometimes and four VAC systems sometimes. But there's also like rest defense. Uh, sometimes you need only two center backs at the back of your attacking set. And sometimes you need three. Sometimes you need those three to be pushed in a little bit to uh, cut out counters a little faster. There, there are a lot of different advantages of this elbow back, elbow back thing, but I think that uh, the main thing is just elite teams need that flexibility. They need to be able to be four at the back sometimes and three at the back sometimes. And Pep Guardiola has done this uh, with Kyle Walker for a few years now, um, but he's really committed to it lately now that he's started uh, inverting Cancelo kind of almost by default. Uh, there's a lot more of that versatility. Uh, Pirlo was not hugely successful at Juventus this season, uh, but I, I liked his ambition uh, because he came in from day one and you know wanted to do complex elbow back things with Danilo. Uh, he, he was very, like he had some very complex uh, positional play ideas that never quite uh, came together, I think, in his first season. We'll see if he gets another year to try that. Um, yeah, and, and, and other clubs have done this to varying degrees. Uh, Barcelona's kind of toyed with it, some under Kike Stepgen, uh, some under Coman. Um, really, the, the, the only clubs that haven't done some variation on an elbow back idea, at least occasionally, are uh, Bayern Munich is very, like, stoutly 4-2-3-1, and uh, at least post Tuchel, uh, Pochettino's PSG was pretty, uh, pretty 4 2 3 one You know, they would do some Salida Lava Piana where the defensive mid drops between the center backs. Like that's kind of a thing that's been a tactical trend for at least 10 years now. Um, but they didn't do a lot of elbow back shifting, a lot of complicated uh, shape changes. For me, it's very interesting kind of looking at it both from an analytical point of view and secondly, as a coach's point of view, um, for me, it's less of the intent. Like, I doubt very much the likes of Tuchel, Pochettino are going out to their players before the game saying, we're going to build up with a back three um, when this arises, when that happens, and when that happens. No, in my idea, my own idea, it's more of an intention. It's more of the effect of a wider part of a system. For example, at Man City, if you have Sinchenko at wide, you'll see Cancelo come in off the right and he'll invert into the pockets. Sometimes we'll even see Rodri caught out wide and we'll see one of the centre half step up to break a line in midfield. And I think that's what's the most interesting part of it because there's a new frontier in my eyes of football and athletics coming to the forefront, John. And even just the past few days, and um, the athletic Tom Warville did a piece on essentially was the passes uh, which Man City won this year's Premiership title with. And for me, you know, Man City are a conundrum. You're trying to work out on a weekly basis or on a game-to-game -game basis what they're actually trying to do. But when you look at the passing networks and passing receptions of each of the 10 outfield Man City players, you can kind of almost reverse engineer that into its essence and actually see the intention on Guardiola's part of actually what he wants his team to do. And I think when you have the data and the, anal the analysis and the metrics speaking out to you like that. It's very exciting times. And um, I suppose what I want to do now is jump on to the next part of that question, which was uh, the Myers-Briggs personality test for midfielders, which was, if we're talking about elbow backs, the amount of work you needed to put into this next segment of work, John, was <laughs> astronomical. Um, evaluating and ranking 340 midfielders from Europe's top five leagues and categorizing them to 16 different parts. What was the madness behind that? This, this was kind of something that I've been joking about with uh, my friends at American Soccer Analysis for a while. Uh, a lot of what data analytics tries to do, uh, specifically in the, in the player evaluation uh, area in, the, you know, in recruiting, is to say not just which players are good, but what are they good at, right? What's What kind of player is this player? And that's, that's a challenge. And so I'd always joke that the uh, 
Myers-Briggs test, you know, famously has like these four pairs, right? These four types that, that will tell you you're an ISTJ, you're an ENTP, whatever. Um, and so we needed something like that for soccer, right? We needed to know, uh, you know, how, how can we kind of very concisely express that this player does this and not that, and this and not that, you know, across four pairs. Uh, and so I did this in kind of a semi-serious way, most, mostly a joke really with uh, data from FB ref, stats bomb data. And uh, I, I think that there are a lot of like really smart ways that you can use data to tell you what kind of player a player is. This way was, was not very sophisticated. It was, you know, I, I identified my four pairs. I forget what they were exactly. Um, but they, they actually did wind up, I think, sorting players into types that more or less made sense. Uh, you know, they were, I, I looked, literally, I looked at the descriptions of like what the actual Myers-Briggs types meant, like what extroversion was, what introversion was, what it meant to be thinking or judging or perceiving or feeling. And then I tried to think of like, okay, well, what stat kind of corresponds to that, right? And, uh, and what I came up with then was these data-based player types that you could map on to the actual description of Myers-Briggs personalities and say, well, okay, yeah, I guess like Kevin De Bruyne is kind of an architect, right? Like, I guess that sure, N'Golo Kante is a, is a protector or whatever it was that he said it was. Like this, the personality types kind of matched how you think about these players on the field. So it was, it was fun. And I think people responded to that. And I suppose... You begun that by saying, John, you were joking around with a few pals before actually compiling this work together. Were you surprised by any of the results or, as you said, it was largely expected? I think that to the extent that I was surprised, I didn't take it too seriously because, like I said, this was a very like crude way of actually doing this, this player sorting. If I were going to do it seriously, trying to identify player roles and types, I would probably use... Uh, a more sophisticated algorithm like the UMAP thing that I used for the seven styles of soccer, which is where I kind of, uh, I, I used a, a much more advanced algorithm and a lot more data points to try to identify what teams play styles were. And I think that you can do something similar with players and I probably will at some point. Some of my friends have done that already. Um, but because this was only using literally like eight stats, right? You're, you're only going to get a very broad picture of what the players are. Uh, and so where players didn't match what I thought they were, I probably trusted my intuition more than I trusted uh, where they were coming out on this Myers-Briggs thing. I suppose one similar style of football, which will be, uh, <laughs> which will be facing each other in a few weeks, John, will be uh, the Champions League final when Chelsea play against Manchester City. How do you believe Guardiola will combat Tuchel's tactics? I mean, we've seen in your latest piece how Madrid struggled against that unique access of Jorginho and Golo Kante in midfield. You feel Guardiola will bring, obviously he'll bring something to the table, but we've seen, albeit with a heavily rotated sides in the FA Cup semi-final and last week's Premier League fixture, that Guardiola still, you know, he's going into the water but he's going you know one step at a time he's not going into the deep end as of yet yeah it's it's an interesting question like what to take away from uh last week's game where yeah both teams were well city was heavily rotated chelsea was was less rotated and and chelsea under tuchel has, has really had kind of one consistent look they have like a couple minor variations within that look but they play more or less the same way every week whereas city you know they're they're doing different things and in this particular match they were doing very different things from what they do week in and week out i don't think that that was a preview of the final i don't think that Guardiola wanted to tip his hand in a game that he didn't have to win i don't maybe he was kind of experimenting to see how Chelsea's standard shape would respond to this uh, this thing that he did. I also don't think that uh, Gordiel is going to do what Zidane did in the first half of the second leg against Chelsea, which was to play three at the back, but then to put two center backs all the way on one touch line and one center back all the way on the other touch line and to pass the ball over to the two center backs 
and then to switch to the far center back just as a way to really split the front three of Chelsea apart. Um, Chelsea usually, you know, presses in a, a, a mid block. They don't, they're not too pressy most of the time, but the front three uh, kind of stay tight with that midfield pair that you talked about, Jorginho and Conte. And teams usually have a, a hard time penetrating that kind of pentagonal shape, that front five. Um, and so they play around it. They play to the touchline and then they get trapped against the touchline. And that's where Chelsea wins the ball. Obviously, City doesn't want to fall into that touchline trap. How they're going to break the front five down to get there, I'm not sure. I do think that if they're chasing the game, they might try something like Zidane tried. Uh, a guy named Sahil pointed out to me that uh, Graham Potter had actually done something similar with Brighton uh, like a couple weeks before Zidane did that. So clearly these coaches are taking notes on each other as to like, how do we try to break the shape down? Because it's been very hard to score on Chelsea ever since Tuchel took over the uh, the three at the back system has been very effective. Of course. And for me, I think what will be vital in a few weeks, John, when the final takes place in Porto, will be whoever gets that initial first goal. Because for me, you have two managers in Guardiola and Tuchel that are so obsessed with control. But what does control actually mean? And when you're playing against another manager who's so obsessive with it, um, as a Chelsea fan watching games, what you can visibly notice is this pressing trap when they bring the ball out, what, when the opposition brings the ball wide, you have Werner, he'll have um, the passing lane blocked back to the centre half or to the goalkeeper. He'll have Azpilicueta on a right pushed in. You'll have N'Golo Kante or Jorginho pushed in. But City, we've seen, have shown a capability to play out against that. But it's just in transition then when they're going forward, albeit a 3v3 or 4v4. There's that big gap in space in the middle, which then Chelsea then get the ball and build again from the back. So for me, I don't know. I actually don't see. I, I, I can't fathom which way this final's going to go. I think we're in for a tactically intense battle. I don't know which way you see it going, John. I, I agree with you wholeheartedly. I think I don't know what to expect. Uh, I think that both clubs are very good uh, to have, you know, probably the top four or five clubs in the world, at least. And, and certainly two of the smartest managers. Uh, Grace Robertson, who writes uh, another newsletter, Grace on Football, uh, did a series a while back where she rewatched all of uh, Guardiola's knockout Champions League games where he did all these things where he's, you know, he's famous for overthinking big games for trying kind of uh, formations that his team hasn't sufficiently trained on. Uh, and it's, you know, he's trying to unsettle the opponent, uh, but usually he winds up confusing his own team and they play worse than they're capable of. And we see this you know, almost every season. He hasn't done it so far uh, in this uh, Champions League. He, he honestly, if, if anything, he was not inventive enough against PSG. He was a little too cautious. I wouldn't be surprised, honestly, knowing what I know about Guardiola, if he comes out uh, doing something totally different in the final than we've seen in the months leading up to the final. Uh, and I don't think that would necessarily go well for him, but I do think that, you know, the, the point that Grace hammered home in her series was Pep makes these changes in big games because he's terrified of counterattacks. And there are very few teams that are scarier on the break right now uh, than Chelsea, spearheaded by Warner. Uh, there's so much speed, especially if he, you know, if he starts Pulisic up there as well. Uh, any any of those forwards can kill you on the break, and Chelsea is very good at that. So I think that Manchester City will be cautious. I, I don't think that they're going to want to park themselves in Chelsea's half uh, because that that threat of the break is just too much. Um, and I think that when we see City not want to um, expose themselves to the counter, we, we saw some of it against PSG. I think that uh, maybe we'll see Zinchenko start over Cancelo. Uh, Pep's done that in the second leg of a couple of Champions League ties this year. Uh, go with more of a flat back four rather than the inverted fullback. Uh, put Foden up on the left wing and try to play to him a little bit quicker so that City doesn't have to have the long, slow possessions uh, so that they can attack a little quicker and hopefully expose themselves less to Chelsea's counters. 
this is all a guess. I mean, I don't think that anybody knows very well what City's going to do. I do think that we know more or less what Chelsea is going to look like. Um, and so it'll be interesting to see how Pep tries to solve that problem. For me, um, another recent piece from yourself, well, it was a tweet, John, was the first half of PSG City of the first leg like, a few weeks back. It was really interesting how quickly PSG copped on to the way City were pressing in that 4 4 2. You had Paredes drop in between the two centre halves and Marquinhos Kempembe. You had Florenzi and Backer go 10, 15 yards higher up the pitch. And the knock on effect was he pushed Guardiola, pushed forward now to Marquinhos because he didn't want to play it out. And then in turn, which left Florenzi with the freedom of the right flank. For me, I can see City setting up in their usual attacking shape, but defensively, how they press against Chelsea. I don't see how they would press in that normal 4-4-2 shape playing against Chelsea's back five, but nonetheless, it'll be interesting. And for me as a Chelsea fan, a long two weeks to wait. But um, <laughs> John, I mean, you work with, of course, managers and coaches. Um, one early subscriber to your newsletter, in fact, was Bob Bradley. What separates the likes of these guys in, I suppose, getting their ideas across from players in terms of translating what you give them to be put into actual insights? You know, I, I don't have insight into how a lot of coaches operate on the day to day. I don't know what it is that they do differently with their players that produces these effects. I do know the difference between a good coach and a bad coach on the field. I think that we can see that uh, we can see those effects and my understanding from talking to some of these coaches, from reading what these coaches uh, say, how they describe their working methods. Um, I think that a lot of it is about um, clarity, really. It's, it's clarity of expression. It's the job of a coach is to communicate. The job of a coach is a lot like a teacher. Uh, and if you can't express your ideas, it doesn't really matter whether your ideas are complex or simple. What matters is that all of the players have the same understanding of what the team is trying to do. Um, because I think that that is the main difference between a well-coached team and a poorly coached team is that you can see visibly in a poorly coached team that the players don't understand or don't have the same understanding of what the team is trying to do. And so they're individually trying to do different things. So I, I, I think that uh, simplification often helps with that, right? I think that uh, even, even very bad teams can be well coached uh, just by simplifying what it is that they're trying to do, by expressing it in terms that leave no room for error. Uh, very good teams can also be pretty simple. They can do the same thing week in and week out. And if you have better players than other teams, you can just impose your, your style on them. And a lot of good coaches do that. Liverpool is, is a classic example of uh, a team that usually tries to, when, when everyone is healthy, play the same way against every opponent. Um, and then you have, you know, other coaches who like Guardiola will vary their approach from time to time. And so the important thing, if, if you're trying to do complex things like Guardiola tries to do, or like Nagelsmann tries to do is really just to communicate to your players so that they know what the hell is going on. And I think that that's, that's the reason that Guardiola has failed a lot of times in these big games is, you know, when, when you throw together an idea three days before a big game and you try to explain it to your players on the pitch two days before a big game, you're probably not going to see 100% shared understanding out there when, uh, when the whistle blows, right? Yes. I mean, I'm just curious from your own point of view, John, I suppose the coaches you'd be dealing with, they're fairly open-minded people if they're reaching out to you, of course, to speak analytics and cold-hearted data when it comes to football. But do you find an awful lot of the time you find yourself challenging their biases? Or on the other hand, are you reaffirming a lot of what they already knew? I would say that, I mean, for one thing, any, any high-level professional coach knows more about this game than I do. I, I am not arrogant enough to think that I have things to teach them. Um, I do think that 
it's helpful to think about the game in different ways. And I think that uh, even people who know the game inside and out sometimes believe things that uh, that the data doesn't back up, right? That we don't see uh, these things borne out on the field. So while I am not as expert as a guy like Bob Bradley, um, I, I do have access to data that can tell me in fairly objective terms what is and isn't happening on the field. And I can explain, you know, I, I have enough tactical expertise to explain why these numbers say what they say. Um, and, you know, some, sometimes, uh, sometimes Bob and I argue about the validity of that data uh, for reasons like what we've talked about earlier involving context and whatnot. Um, but I, I think that for me and, and really for everyone who's seriously curious about the game, there is no uh, single path to understanding soccer. Uh, data is not going to tell you everything. Tactical theory definitely is not going to tell you everything. Uh, even sitting in on a coach's training sessions won't tell you everything about what they actually do come game day. And so it's a constant process of checking every uh, every source of information about what's going on and trying to understand how they all fit together to get a fuller picture of the of the game yeah, of course and I suppose given that you're still on this roller coaster John when it comes to football analytics where and when is this next frontier going to be where do you see the industry within the next five to ten years perhaps Certainly, the uh, the big thing on the analytics side is going to be uh, wider spread adoption of tracking data and finding ways to make it useful. I think that one possibility uh, is that it's simply not feasible for individual clubs to hire out uh, the experts that they would need to to really do interesting things with tracking data, and so we may see. Uh, more consultancies hiring experts in-house and then farming that expertise out to clubs. Um, but if you do that, I think the challenge is that it's harder to get things that are tailored to your game model and to what your club is trying to do. So part of the reason that I'm able to kind of predict the future here is that we've seen this future already play out in other sports in the United States. Uh, the NBA, for example, is kind of a few years ahead of soccer in terms of uh, the adoption of tracking data. And some teams use consultancies uh, to just kind of give them uh, standard metrics based on this tracking data. Some teams have very advanced uh, in-house analytics departments uh, like Liverpool or, or Barcelona do. For me, what, what I'm most interested in and what I think that we'll see down the road, it may not be five years, it may be more like 10 years or, or even more than that, is tracking data-based analytics informing game models. And people are already fantasizing about how data can really change the way that we play. But I don't think that we're really close to seeing that in action. Uh, although one of my friends said recently, and I think this is true, you don't need uh, PhD level expert data scientists at every club to change the way the game is played. What you need is that expertise at a few influential clubs because clubs copy each other all the time, right? If, if, one, if one club has really good analysts telling them that, uh, you know, here's a more efficient way to play the game and other clubs see that that way of playing the game is winning games, They'll just imitate what they see on the field. You don't need the data to get that. Uh, and I think that maybe we'll see some of that kind of copycatting our way into an analytics future. Be terrific to see. And yeah, we're all looking forward to the next frontier. And um, finally, to close, John, I mean, I know you're constantly inundated with requests from budding tactical video analysts with possibly advice as to how to enter the industry. But John, if people were wishing to pursue a similar path or career to yourself, what advice would you indeed have for them? 
I think that my advice is to to learn as much as possible and to share what you learn. Um, I think that understanding the sport is a collective effort and uh, we all approach it from different ways with different uh, types of expertise. And I think that those of us who are deeply invested in trying to understand the game really appreciate when other people share what they think they know about it so that we can test our own ideas against it. So what that means in, in practical terms is just read everything that you can, watch everything that you can, and then write and talk about it, right? I think that if, if you're trying to build a career in this game uh, and, and you're not already working for a club, the best way to get to a club is just to publish what you know. And if people find that useful, then, uh, then they'll hire you. Or if you're not trying to work for a club and you're like me and you're just writing about it uh, because you enjoy writing about it, you know, if, if you're able to, to teach people something about the game uh, or, or to make them think about it in a different way, uh, readers will respond to that as well. So that's, uh, that's how I think about soccer analysis of all kinds. It's just we're all trying to understand the game better, right? Exactly. It's a, it's a community effort. Yeah. <laughs> and it's something which is very much a daily effort as well. Yeah. But um, John, it's been utterly illuminating and fascinating to hear the game of football from your lens, from your very own perspective. Should people wish to keep up to date with your own very fascinating work, John, where's best to catch you online? So I would tell them to sign up for my newsletter, uh, which is space space second that. Yes. <laughs> yeah. space 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 letter.com is, is the newsletter. Uh, you can sign up for the free version. You can become a paid subscriber and read everything that I've ever written. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter at John Space Muller. Um, yeah, that's those are the ways to find me. And it's been absolutely tremendous having you on. Must do this again in the future. Um, <laughs> hopefully, the next time you co come on, that much will have changed. But you know, the roller coaster that is football analytics, things are moving pretty quickly at the moment. But John, keep in touch and keep up the great work, and hope to have you on again in the future. Been a pleasure. Good luck to uh, Chelsea in the final. <laughs> Let's go, hopefully. <laughs>